Very good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to our second webinar under the 50 years of new economic policy at IDEAS. Uh, my name is Vaishmi Rao and I will be your MC for the day. Uh, thank you for spending your Friday uh, morning with us uh, as we launch the final paper under this project, uh, The New Economic Policy and Contesting Bumi Putra Identity Among Orang Asli and the Indigenous People of Sabah and Sarawak. Um, just a little housekeeping uh, before we get started. If you have any questions uh, during the webinar, please put them into the Q&A box. Uh, our moderator for today, uh, Mr. Kamal Sohangi, will bring them up during the panel discussion. We will also have questions uh, time for questions at the end. Um, just to clarify, uh, at IDEAS, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external, to work together. Um, IDEAS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, everyone here is responsible for making this event a safe space for public discourse. Um, we will begin our webinar today with some welcoming remarks from uh, IDEAS CEO, Trisha Yeo. Uh, Trisha was unfortunately not able to join us today, uh, so we will be playing a pre-recorded welcoming message from her. Thank you and have a, a great session today. Least uh, launch of the policy. A very good morning. Uh, I'm Trisha, CEO of Ideas, and thank you so much for being here as we come to the third, last but not least, uh, launch of the policy paper and webinar if, of the week. So as mentioned over the last two days, um, Ideas embarked on this research and advocacy project in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Malaysia's new economic policy with the aim of revisiting and re-examining the successes and shortcomings of the policy and its implementation in subsequent development plans. We have gone through so much over the last 50 years. It's a policy that has shaped and reshaped our economic and social economic landscape so significantly. It is something that uh, we cannot avoid talking about. And over the last two days, I'm sure we would have had wonderful discussions and uh, interactions with our esteemed speakers and the public as well about the impact of the NEP um, generally on the economic landscape. On the first day, yesterday, we talked about the impact of the NEP on national unity and Bangsa Malaysia. And finally, today, we're talking about the impact of NEP on indigenous people. So we have with us esteemed Professor Wan Zawawi Ibrahim, a friend as well, uh, and his, his paper is titled The New Economic Policy and the Identity Question of Indigenous People in Peninsular Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. So in this paper, uh, Professor Zawawi reviews how the NEP as a policy with regard to achieving the objectives of eradicating poverty of Bumiputra has divided this socially constructed identity into two, a dominant ethnic of Peninsular Malays and the non-dominant ethnic of uh, non-Malays and the Bumiputra minorities ranging from Orang Asli to the Dayaks of Sarawak and Kadazan Dusun and the Murut of Sabah. Contrary to the spirit of the NEP to promote national unity, he argues that the Bumiputra identity is one which is fraught with its own ambiguities and contradictions. Through his paper, Prof Zawawi provides rich empirical evidence to unpack the unintended consequences of the NEP, which has generated its own class gaps in both the dominant Malay Bumiputra and the non-dominant non-Malay Bumiputra sectors of the Malaysian population. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I really look forward to hearing uh, Professor Wan Zawawi's presentation, as well as what our panelists would have to respond to and I wish all of you a wonderful discussion. Please continue to follow us, um, our various activities that are coming up. We have many events uh, slated even to the rest of the year and uh, follow us on website and on our social media platforms. Thank you for being with us as Ideas con continues to explore these very difficult questions and grapples with policy solutions that can improve the country moving forward always. Thank you, goodbye.
Thank you to Trisha for that uh, warm welcome. Um, I will now introduce our speaker for today, uh, Prof. Wan Zawawi Ibrahim. Uh, Prof. Zawawi received his doctoral degree in social anthropology from Monash University, Australia, um, and served as a professor of anthropology at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences um, and Institute of Asian Studies at the University of Brunei Darussalam from uh, 2011 to 2020. Uh, currently, he is an adjunct professor at Taylor's University, Malaysia. Um, over to you, Prof. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you to Ideas, Trisha, and Pasnavi for inviting me. <clears throat> so as a social anthropologist, I'm very much challenged about this particular topic uh, because uh, for the last 20 years or so, I have actually been doing research on the ground <clears throat> pertaining to indigenous communities in Malaysia, uh, from Orang Asli of Peninsula to uh, the Penan of uh, Sarawak and Karatan uh, zone of uh, Sabah and um, also uh, some other communities uh, in, in, in Sarawak and in Sabah. Um, so it's a very challenging topic. And it is also a time for reflection because 50 years is a long time. And as they say, you know, so much water has flown under the bridge. So many bridges have fallen and so many trees have fallen. If, if you know, if the indigenous communities were to say it, you know, so much land has been dispossess last 50 years or so. And it is time for reflection. Uh, of course, the, the topic today is about Bumiputrism, Bumiputrism as, as an identity, an authority defined identity central to the self-identification of the nation state. Now, of course, at face value, the term Bumiputra was supposed to create a sense of egalitarianism between those who are deemed indigenous, sons of the soil or princes of the soil, lumping together, as Trisha said just now, between the dominant ethnic, which is the Malay Muslim of peninsula, and those of the non-dominant ethnic, uh, consisting of the Orang Asli of Semananjung, who are minorities, non-Muslim, the non-Malay, with the those are the indigenes of Sarawak and Sabah. In Sarawak, they call it, they call themselves a generic term as Daya, but that actually, you know, it's just a, a, a generic term which incorporates, you know, the Iban, Bidayo, Orang Ulu, and even Orang Ulu is a, it's also a generic term that involves other kind of sub tribal groups. And of course, in Sabah, it involves the Katastan Tuson and the Murat. Uh, and of course, the Baja, who are also not Muslim, but they are not, they are in a sense uh, part of the minority, yeah, who are non Muslims. So we are talking here about central Bumiputrism versus peripheral Bumiputrism. Now, we know that central Bumiputrism was very much specific to the evolution of the of Malaya's independence, struggle for independence uh, from the British. Uh, the concern here was with the economic protection of the Malays, the so-called special privileges, and of course the sovereignty of Malay identity, which includes language, Islam, and the Malay monarchy. And this was very much directed against the economic dominance of the immigrant population. Uh, especially the Chinese. So it was this critical features of Malay Bumiputrism, which continued to define what I call the superstructural aspect of the state in independent Malaya in 1957, and its entry into Malaysia in 1963, when they were joined by other Bumiputras and non Bumiputras from East Malaysia. So by 1957, when independence was forged, my argument is that an ethnicized state was already formed. 
a state with very strong superstructural elements that project Malay identity, which relate to Malayness, Islam, uh, special privileges, um, the Malay monarchy, etc. So the ethnicized state was already formed. Huh? Um, then, of course, in 1970 came Malaysia when Sabah, Sarawak, and uh, Singapore, and of course, Peninsula Malaysia were joined together in terms of Malaysia. Um, in 1970, we saw the, the inception of the NEP, yeah? uh, in which the, the, the term Bumiputraism, Bumiputra was, uh, was, was uh, projected as, an, uh, as a national identity term um, that is supposed to promote unity and bring all the uh, Malaysia together. Uh, especially between Putras. But as, as, as Trisha was saying just now, the particular term uh, between Putra is fraught with ambiguities. It is, it is not a constitutional term, by the way, you know, uh, not like Malay. Uh, so it is a term, a constructed term, yeah, uh, which has its origin and history from the specific trust struggle of the Malays uh, in terms of achieving independence from the British vis-a-vis -vis the context of Peninsular Malaysia, not of Malaysia. So that's very important to note. Now, of course, with 50 years, the hindsight of 50 years, we can actually then reflect upon what happened after 1970. And of course, the first important reflection, I would say, is by the indigenous, indigenous themselves, by the indigenous community themselves. So here I'm going to pick some, um, some reviews, some statements uh, pertaining to Bhuniputra, pertaining to identity yeah, from, the, from the indigenous communities themselves. Um, first of all, from the uh, chairman of Pozen, the Satuan Orang Asli. Yeah? They were concerned about orang asli to be put in their tempat yang sewajarnya, the rightful place. That is to protect orang asli and their religious freedom as enshrined in the constitution. Plan integration and assimilation to be avoided as it has led to negative effects um, on the progress of the Didi orang asli society. Orang asli have experienced cultural erosion, hakisan budaya, 80% of Orang Asli culture has been lost and only 10% of Orang Asli admit that they are Orang Asli. In reality, there is no more Asliness. They have been assimilated to other communities. And then there are the other Orang Asli who basically express their sense of otherness or being other, yeah? Against a nationhood that dislocates and dispossesses. For instance, this particular statement, at this moment, the Orang Asli that I'm referring to are people without power, without knowledge and without capital. Hence, they suffer, the sexer. Here, we left them in their own, we left them in their own period, the Stone Age. I don't think the Orang Asli would have suffered as much as now. Orang Asli definitely desire development, but at time, development clarifies the Orang Asli. Because of such development, Orang Asli living on the periphery of highways and town to be pushed forever deeper into the interior. And another particular reflection from uh, a particular Batin, yeah? when he was, his particular community of Temuan was moved about from the location of of uh, National University, which is, which is now Yusuf Bangsaan. That was the home of the Orang Asli Temuan before it was turned to university. They were moved to another area in Semenye, in sorry, in Denkel. And then later on, they were moved again into Semenye. So this is the, the reflection of the Batin, yeah? When I was talking to him about him being shifted around. Uh, because the, the idea, if you, if you if you talk to the Jabatan Hal Asli, 
they will say that the orang asli like to be moved around. They like to move around. It's difficult to settle the orang asli because they like to pindah randa. But the story by the by the Batin, you know, expresses a different kind of discourse. When he says, we are always being shifted about asyik dipindah saja. Before the government said, this orang asli always shift, shift, shift. From hill to hill, from hill to hill. Orang asli ini selalu dipindah, pindah, pindah, kepindah, kepindah, bukit, ke bukit, ke bukit. Now, it's the government that wants us to shift to orang asli. How can this be? What is right? The government instead is making the orang asli shift. How can we be permanent? Mana nak tetap? How can we ever succeed? Just as we're about to tap the rubber, we have to move. And then there's this reflection by another orang asli uh, when his whole village had to be relocated from a, a kampong that was self-sustaining to another kampong which is which is which has you know which which has which has doesn't have good soil uh, which was not the kind of there was not the site that was promised to them by the government but they had to move because of the building of the new airport at Sepang so at one time they were they were part of the Sepang airport before Sepang became an airport so this is what he says now what I feel most sad is that we have to start from a very uncertain age of development. We have to start again from a period that we have left behind, as if the orang asli are starting life from scratch. We want our people now to wear neckties with a language that is elegant. If possible, we want to be able to speak the language of the better educated, not still struggling to kial kial at the level of basic economic needs or trying to find work and so on. Okay, then we move to Sabah and Sarawak. Again, listening to the reflection of their, by the indigenous leaders. Um, again, uh, from Professor Jayum, uh, Iban scholar. He said, it is not worthy that the Daya and the Karazan Dusun, although a majority ethnic group in their respective home states, now refer to themselves as a minority Boimputra. The terminology Bamutras distinguished them from the Malay Muslim Wiputra, who had been the main benefactors of the NAP. To be sure, the cry for Dayakism has muted somewhat over the past decade, but the sense of dissatisfaction among the Daya would not disappear merely by co-opting a few Daya politicians into the ruling coalition. And of course, from the least empowered of the Daya, the Orang Ulu, from Francis Leon, he said, in summary, Categorizing them as Bumiputras had brought very little socioeconomic benefit to the Orang Ulus compared to the Malays. To the Orang Ulu, they are more like paupers to the Putra, prince of the Bumi land of Malaysia. Where in the world can you find a prince who does not have ownership or even basic asset a human being has, that is, the land which he inherited from his ancestors? If you do not own the land on which you stay, you are forever an illegal squatter of the nation. Even migrants in this resource rich nation have titles to the land. And then from Sabah, Dr. Onkili sums up this a similar disenchantment with the so-called Bumiputraism identity. Not much can be said about the development of Kadazan Bumiputraism today, except to note that Kadazan Duson are increasingly less encumbered with the Bumiputra status accorded to them 40 years ago. There is a growing disenchantment with the term as Kadazan no longer subscribe to the privileges analogous to the Malay's policy. Many in the community treat it with indifference. Others tend to joke about it uh, and terming it third class Bumiputra or pseudo Bumiputra and Bumiputra Chilo. So when asked about her status or his status of being Bumi, an average Kadazan respond would be, that just means I'm native, I'm not Malay. In its current form, this is the current form, which is the real disconnect on the view of Bimputra among Kadazan and the view of the Malay. In conclusion, if Bimputraism for the Kadazan can no longer meet 
analogous to the position of the Malay, their lingering disdain for the policy would continue as Karazan regard policy as nothing less than a form of ethnic ornamentalization. Now, then from our own economist from Sarawak, uh, Dr. Berlin, Madeline Burma, who talks about, who says that the policies were conceived in advance to advance Malay economic well being and narrow the income gap between the Malays, Wimputra, and Chinese in Peninsular Malaysia. Inputs from Sabah and Sarawak, particularly non Malay Wimputras on the ethnic minorities, are almost non existent. And she continues continuing the pro Malay oriented policy would apparently lead to internal contradiction and tension within the Miputra community and sowing the seeds of future problems. Although the ethnic minorities are Miputra, the policies tend to benefit the Miputra Malays, particularly but those in Peninsular Malaysia. So the question that I'm, I'm asking them, was the planning of the NAP intended to only benefit the Malay Miputras? Was there an ethnicizing undercurrent in the NEP objectives. And indeed, the other question to ask is, who among the Malay Biputras have reaped the most benefit from the NEP? Was it also in the planning that the NEP had brought more benefit to those Biputra elites in the political circle, both at the federal and state level? Was the NEP an inherently ethnicized economic project? Was the NEP an inherently class-based project? The answer is no, because these are unintended consequences of the NEP, brought about not by the objectives of the NEP per se, for these objectives were couched in very generalistic term in terms of wealth distribution, restructuring, and equity. So it is the argument of this paper that the exercising and class skewed outcomes of the NEP was due to the nature of the Malaysian state itself, which was a mediator of the NEP, in which the state was both an ethnicizing state and a developmental state. Okay, so now the question is, what is the impact of the so-called Malaysian ethnicizing and developmental state on this identity? So from the beginning of, from the beginning as enshrined in the federal constitution that came to force in 1963 was that the indigenous population of Sabah, Sarawak natives would possess a similar status as the Malays of the peninsula. And of course on these rights, on the Orang Asli, the constitution remained silent. But this misunderstands the political rationale of the invention of Biputra that eclipsed the legal necessities of, for two reasons. First of all, as I mentioned just now, the framing of imperialism derived from a particular political struggle to its dependence from the British over the issue of special right of the Malays and not of other indigenous communities in East Malaysia or even in Semenanjung, pertaining Orang Asli. Secondly, the immediate context of the NEP's implementation was the aftermath of the 1969 racial conflict, the race relation race conflict, um, and Amnos claimed that the Malays needed protection through a policy of trusteeship and advancement vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese projected as being economically dominant. So this two motion, uh, these two factors set in motion the particular direction that NEP policies would take over the next 20 years and beyond. So the NEP itself was mediated by the apparatus of the state. And in this paper, I'm arguing that even before the formation of NEP in Malaysia, the genesis of an ethnizing state was already there. It was already there, the ethnizing, the, 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 the salient aspect of an ethnizing state was already inbuilt in the state when it achieved independence. As we see that one of the important aspects of dependent was the ethnic bargain, yeah? In which uh, the Malays in the sand, uh, the, 
won the privilege, you won the, 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 the concession in terms of exchange with the non Malays in terms of this ethnic bargain, in terms of language, in terms of religion, Islam, Islam, and the retainment of the, of the monarchy, uh, and also the protection of the special privileges of the Malays. So the, the state was already what I call ethicized, even before it became part of Malaysia, even before it, it, it formulated the idea of NAP. And of course, when NAP came, it invites the idea of a strong state, what we now call the development state. And already we have many political scientists who talk about what is the nature of the development state. It is not a, develop, a development state that promotes development, but over and above that, it talks about social control, political control, uh, repressive laws, because they have to control a stronger state when it wants to bring development, sometimes has to control resistance. And therefore, it has to formulate laws but that are coercive. Um, and then subordinating of the civil society. Um, and we have political scientists like uh, um, David Crouch, for instance, who talked about an ambiguous regime, which is neither fully democratic or authoritarian. Uh, and Sher Naya and Vishu Belma, who identify a subordinated civil society. Um, and of course, scholars like Joe Moore and, and Terence uh, Gomez have elaborated on Malaysia's form of bureaucratic rental capitalism, uh, the economics of state intervention and the political constraint that the state has to manage. Yeah? Uh, so in a sense, developmentalism involves more just uh, basically uh, development, increase of income or the making of the, of, of the middle class uh, or industrialization, but involves more than that. Yeah? Uh, it's a specific ideology and stage managed model of political economic intervention placed at the service of the goal of managing accumulation in an increasingly globalized capitalist system. Development citizen became the way to justify the organization, the reorganization society into more efficient units of production, the unfettered exploitation of the environment and natural resources and political repression. It is a trajectory that has been oblivious to social and environmental costs as long as it contributed to a narrow vision of national power and the class interests of a small elite. This is of course, not just a Malaysian problem, but a global one, cutting across many ostensibly different societies in global society. But what is what makes Malaysia a very interesting uh, case study is its version of developmentalism unique in the way that it was harnessed to the exercising state already in the making at the time of the implementation of the NAP. Yeah. So a development state was harnessed to or, an already incipient ethnicizing state. So to all intents and purposes, the privileging, the privileging of elite ethnic bargains and forms of power sharing, usually described as form of constitutionalization, was already initiated in the years leading up to America to Madeka in 1957 and reinforced by the creation of Federation of Malaya, Malaysia in 1963 and thereafter. And of course, the 1969 uh, racial riot, in a way, reinforced uh, the state to further legitimizes, legitimize this ethnicizing project. And after that, in 1970, we saw also the, the formation of uh, the national cultural policy in which Islam, and Malayans became uh, the definer of national culture and national identity. So again, that creates, in a way, the what we call now the central Bhutanism, um, over and above what we call the peripheral Bhutanism. <clears throat> so there have of course been forms resistant to and counter narration 
against the hegemonic project of the Malaysian state. Some of this resistance has been advanced by political leaders who in both Sarawak and Sabah sought to navigate the tension between their role as representatives of Bumiputra constituencies in the periphery and the integrationist demands of the center that were underpinned by NEP goal. These elites resistance, however, have generally been contingent upon a full commitment to the replication of developmentalism in sub-national contexts and also formal political collaboration with the Barisan national government at the center. So elite counter discourses have been heavily circumcised, circumscribed by the logic of capital accumulation and the retention of political power at the state level. The relationship of elite level is best described as one of collusion and compromise. The result at both the center and periphery has been a political economy riven by autocracy, cronyism, corruption, rent seeking, and a lack of transparency and accountability. In short, politically compromised management and leadership in government. In Peninsular Malaysia, my paper has alluded to the political patronage system of the state ruling party AMNO, which through the NDP had evolved its own delivery and distribution system of economic benefit from center to periphery, embracing a network of its own big men with license to accumulate wealth and legitimize in the name of Malay development. This model of Malay of capital accumulation through political patronage was followed faithfully by indigenous political leaders in Sarawak and Sabah. It has led to the emergence of exogenes from indigen. This is after Benjamin's uh, terminology. Indigenes perceive land as the subject of labor, land as the source of life and spiritual sustenance, while exogene are those indigenes who see land as a commodity to be pursued for sale in the market for business and profit. So for the indigene, whether one talks about Peninsula Orang Asli or those indigenes in East Malaysia, identity is always related to a sense of place, the land, the forest, the river, as a source of livelihood and spiritual life. For the household or the village, the long of the longhouse or the village, all those embedded in the customary law or in the native customary law rights, a major part of which has been documented in the colonial and post-colonial state land code, at least for East Malaysia. A transgression of rights means a transgression of your identity. The number one enemy is developmentalism, the notion of civilizing the margin undertaken by colonial or developmental, developmental states in Malaysia, which means the exploitation of land as commodity to the fullest for capitalist based production and profit maximization, especially when such development encroaches on customary land, which is what had occurred under the regime of a developmental state. In Sarawak, this process of civilizing the margin had taken different form from logging at expense of deterritorialization of nomadic indigenes like the Penang, from the natural forest habitat to displacing other indigenes to new unsustainable environment via the construction of hydroelectric dams like the Bakun. And the concept of concept Baru, new concept of plantation development project which had forced indigenes in Sarawak to surrender part of the land to the strategic amendments of the land code by the state. In Sabah, that was already from the beginning of the colonial period an emphasis on the plantation model of development, which after the formation of Malaysia and NEP was further intensified and continued for maximizing of profit monopolized by patrimonial capitalists from Peninsula Malaysia. The Felda model was unceremoniously discarded eventually as it could no longer cope with the expanding market demand and the need for efficient capitalist plantation production utilizing migrant labor. As for the Orang Asli, the economic marginalization and identity rupture had been shaped and early on by the civilizing process of internal colonialism in Malaysia. Two episodes of Orang Asli deterritorialization had occurred, which ruptured the identity. First, the expansion of Orang Asli land the expulsion, sorry, the expulsion of Orang Asli from the fertile land base to the 
to flee further inland to escape the marauding sankal slave hunters of Malay immigrants from Indonesia under the instruction of the British who required the land for planting rice to support immigrant labor in the tin mines and rubber plantation. The second process of deterritorialization or detribalization came after the Second World War, which was initiated by the British in order to put a stop to Orang Asli's alleged support for the communist insurgent in the jungle. In this process, Orang Asli were relocated from jungle habitat to man-made forts, to mix with strangers, causing diseases and death. And just before independence, the British hatched a policy for Orang Asli's assimilation into Malay culture and society, which seal the destiny of Orang Asli identity. So for the Orang Asli, the ethnicizing impact of the state on their sense of identity had begun long before the formation of Malaysia and the NEP. The management of the social control was undertaken by the formation of a special department of Orang Asli affairs, which is now called Jakwa, and the passing of an Orang Asli special legislation, which provides a guideline for the rules of Orang Asli government governance in the post-colonial state. Um, the way for the Orang Asli identity being identified millennials and hence Islam as a policy was already sealed by colonialism for the independent Malayan and Malaysian state to follow. It is not surprising therefore to find researchers on Orang Asli pointing to the ethicizing elements in the post-colonial education combined with Islamization as process policy of the department of Kepatan Orang Asli. But interestingly, most Orang Asli have remained outside Islam. So conclusion, after 50 years, it is necessary but insufficient to view NNP as an example of policy failure or the inadequate implementation of policies that were otherwise sound. In the final analysis, any assessment on NAP must be political in scope. It must take into account how the state itself in the developmentalist and ethnizing guises has produced and reproduced a political system that has purposely permitted dispossession and deterritorialization, that has deliberately treated significant sections of society, its indigenous people as second-class citizens, as others whose rights and very existence are called into question. And that has generated a discourse of ideas and claims that there is no alternative. Each of these elements, a narrow elitist political class, a relationship that treats the land and nature as a commodity to be alienated and commercialized, and a range of common sense understanding of what development, and develop under what development means are all deeply embedded in the multiple layers of state practices at the center and periphery. Any sustainable way of out of the present impasse will have to deal head on with this resilient realities. On the question of indigenous identity and sustainable development in the context of the urban discourse, it is evident that there is there can only be there can be no truly sustainable development without protecting the traditional knowledge and territories of indigenous people. This is from the Sembang. One powerful example of this might entail in practice lies in the full use of customary law and the system of legal pluralism this, that is still viable and sustainable mechanism for protecting indigenous claims to identity to both place and land. In fact, Malaysian Superior Court have recognized the pre-existing right of Orang Asli and other indigenous people to their ancestral and customary land in a number of landmark judgments. This offers a, a powerful mode of resistance to dispossession and deterritorialization in the face of the unabashed attack by the developmental state on indigenous land rights and customary sovereignty. And above all, there are the voices of indigenous communities themselves articulated through storytelling and the narratives of various kinds in testimony of music or fiction or the performing art or in terms of political action, um, like what the Penan did uh, in terms of blockade. Taken together, critical research, policymaking, and counter stories constitute a part of a crucial alternative indigenous project 
of activist discourse and action to contest status grand narratives of developmentalist governance that tyrannize indigenous communities, both in Malaysia and all over the globe. In this development, if this development is to be at all meaningful, it will have to take critical account of what has gone wrong over the last 50 years in relation to the actions of the developmentalist and essentializing state in Malaysia and set the agenda for a politics that truly empowers the whole society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for that rich and comprehensive presentation of your paper. Um, for everyone who has just joined, you can download Prof Zawawi's uh, full paper uh, from the link, uh, if you follow the link uh, put on the chat. Uh, I will now go ahead and uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Kamal Sohaimi, who will be our moderator for today. Just a quick introduction. Uh, Dr. Kamal is a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya. He has researched and published on Orang Asli rights, development, in development in protected areas, undocumented children and rights in Malaysia, as well as on the issues related to reproductive health and adolescent sexuality. His current research is on various themes related to natural resource governance, including exploring roles for Orang Asli to be recognized as a customary land owners in co-management of protected area. Over to you, Dr. Kamal. <laughs> thanks, thanks, uh, Vice, Vice Navi. So I'm just going to really quickly summarize Prof Zawawi's paper, as usual, Prof, interesting um, as it is to listen to you, to speak to you and to read uh, your writing. So Prof Zawawi's paper is both an analysis, a sweeping analysis of politics in Malaysia, the creation and maintenance of the politics of indigeneity and development that has shaped the economic and political direction of Malaysian life for several decades now, in many ways shaping the social and political responses we observe today. Uh, as as well as recognizing the contested response, which is in some ways as a call for action. Central to his talk, of course, is the question of ownership over customary land and the diverse uh, representation to indigeneity. In his paper, he calls, us, he calls for us to recognize the contested nature of the unfolding narrative as a way moving forward. I'm just going to call perhaps on Dr. Anil Puyok first uh, to, come to, to maybe you know, uh, five or 10 minutes uh, to comment on Dr. Zawawi's paper. But very quickly, Dr. Anil Puyok is currently the Deputy Dean of Research and Commercialization and a Senior Lecturer in Politics and Government Studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, University of Malaysia, Sarawak. Dr. Puyok's research interests are in the area of politics of federal state relations, ethnic and regional politics, electoral competition, politics and society, and contemporary Southeast Asian politics. And, has been, and he has been published in various journals, among this Asian Journal of Political Science, Journal of Contemporary Southeast Asia, Kajian Malaysia, and much more. His book is titled Electoral Dynamics in Sarawak, Contesting Developmentalism and Rights, which was published by SIRD and ISIS, uh, which he co-edited with Meredith Weiss. Uh, in 2014, Dr. Puyo established SEEDS, or the Society of Empowerment and Economic Development of Sabah, a think tank dedicated to create a moderate and progressive society in Sabah. Uh, There's a lot more to read on Dr. Anil, but can I pass the, I the floor to you? I the rest. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. so 10 minutes, right? Come on. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's give it 10 minutes. Okay. And, yeah. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this talk uh, and congratulations to uh, Prof. Zawawi for this uh, pertinent work on the NAP and, uh, and its uh, effect uh, on the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak. So I think uh, Prof. Zawawi's work is an attempt to explore the, I would say, the philosophical and the cultural underpinnings of the NAP, arguing about the responses from the culturally diverse indigenous people of uh, Sabah and Sarawak to the Malay-centric uh, federal model of development. So uh, we all know that uh, based on what uh, Prof has just uh, presented to us, even though the intention of the NAP uh, was to assist the Wiputra economically, but it did not necessarily benefit 
that we could try in Samba and Sarawak, especially the non Malays and non Muslim. And uh, I think Prof. Zawawi writes comprehensively in his work about how identities are constructed and, uh, and the role uh, of the state in it. So my, my uh, short presentation, less than 10 minutes, is basically uh, not, not to comment uh, or not to uh, critique, uh -huh. rather to compliment uh, Prof. Zawawi's work by discussing the role of the political elites in Sabah in constructing and deconstructing uh, the ethnic identities of the indigenous people. Dr. Arnold, you can probably go a bit longer if you want. Uh, okay. We're just thinking of the questions that were coming in. But... Right, okay. So I focus mainly on the Kedazan Dusun uh, political elites. So by, by saying this, by sharing this with, uh, with Prof, probably Prof can uh, uh, look at it and, uh, and uh, uh, discuss it more in your, in your paper in order to look at the different dimension or different aspects of how identities are constructed in the context of uh, Sabah and Sarawak politics. Um, I will also talk briefly about the indigenous people in Sarawak by looking at the Dayaks and the state's uh, response uh, to the federal government's political uh, dominance. But before I proceed, I, will, uh, I would like to state uh, that my presentation is not an attempt to discuss uh, and debate the notion of identity or ethnicity and how it is being embedded in the NEP. I think Prof. Uh, Zawi has done uh, that commendably uh, well in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his work. So my attempt here rather is, uh, is, uh, is to discuss ethnic identity as a political construct and to examine ethnic politics and uh, its mobilizing power. So I argue that in the context of, uh, of Sabah and Kedazah politics, there are three sources of mobilization. Number one is cultural organization. So we are talking about the KDCA, uh, we're talking about USDA, we're also talking about uh, recently uh, Mamungu National Congress and so on and so forth. And number two is political parties. And number three, interestingly, is the uh, role of traditional uh, leaders. So we know that in the Kedazan Muslim community, there are two Huguan Xiao, so paramount leader. One is Joseph Pairin, and the other one is uh, Jeffrey Kittingan, even though uh, Jeffrey Kittingan is considered as the smaller Huguan Xiao compared to Pairin, but he has uh, enormous influence, especially among the Kedazan Muslim uh, community. Now, let me start uh, with the construction of the Kedazan Dusun identity and the role of the political elites. Uh, from Kedazan Dusun to Kedazan Dusun, now there are people who want to promote uh, the term uh, Momogun uh, as an umbrella ethnic name for all the Dusunic, Titanic, and Murutic uh, ethnic groups. And 21 Kedazan Dusun uh, and Murut cultural groups uh, were said to support the move. And the argument was that this would augur well uh, for the socioeconomic development and would increase uh, the numerical strength of the indigenous people in, uh, in, uh, in Sabah. But such a move was not without opposition, especially from those who wanted to maintain the Kadazan Dusun name. And interestingly, if seen from the political lenses, uh, uh, Prof. Zawawi is a, is a social anthropologist so I, I am a political researcher. We are looking at it from the, from the political perspective. So one cannot, uh, cannot but argue that political elites were using the ethnic identity issue as a means to mobilize support. And at the center of this uh, debate, identity debate, were noted Kadazan Dusun leaders from Kadazan Dusun based parties, such as uh, PBS and of course. Now, uh, this identity debate has resulted in the intra-ethnic rivalry between the Kadazan and Dusun groups, Kadazan Dusun and Momogun groups, and also among the smaller uh, uh, sub-ethnic groups within the Dusunic, Paitanic, and Murutic ethnic groups. So while the rivalry is not full uh, uh, full blown, the schism between these uh, various groups can be felt until today. And this has also affected the political influence of the Kadazan Dusun as the biggest indigenous uh, group uh, in Sabah and undermine their political uh, representation. So I argue that uh, this unsettling, uh, uh, unsettling uh, search for ethnic identity and the continuing intra-ethnic rivalry have hampered the effort to develop the Kadazan Dusun economically. And we all know that uh, four of the poorest uh, uh, district in Malaysia are from uh, the Kadazan Dusun areas. 
And I would also like to argue that the inability of the Kedazan Dusun political elites uh, to evoke Article 1.3 and to implement it effectively has also weakened their political influence and economic standing. Because as uh, Prof. Zawawi has uh, uh, rightly mentioned, Article 1.3 does not specifically mention uh, the Malay. Uh, the way I read it and the way some Kedazan Dusun read, uh, leaders read it is that Article 153 is supposed to encompass all the ethnic groups in Sabah and Sarawak, but the way it is implemented, that is the problem. So in Sarawak, uh, Sarawak is a bit more different uh, compared to Sabah. Uh, as, as in, in Sarawak, Sarawak is politically more potent and more insulated from uh, uh, federal politics. Identity politics, while germane, is tempered down by regional identity. Uh, expressed through slogans such as Sarawak for Sarawakians and the stance of local leaders not to allow peninsula-based parties to set foot in the state. So the way I look at it is that regional identity in the context of Sarawak is much stronger compared to, 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 uh, to Sabah. But of course, uh, in the end, just like uh, uh, Sabah, uh, the persistence of patronage politics and the extractive nature of the uh, state's economy have marginalized the indigenous uh, people further. So where do we go from here? I think the intentions of the NDP were noble, but the problem was in its implementation, as I mentioned earlier. I am inclined to argue that the NDP had uh, benefit, benefited the indigenous people in some ways even though it had not been able to successfully eradicate uh, poverty and create sizable uh, middle class among the indigenous, uh, indigenous group. There are still many Kadazan Dusun and Dayaks, for instance, uh, who are in dire need of, uh, of economic assistance. So the key for the successful implementations of future economic policy for the indigenous uh, people in Sabah and Sarawak, I think is decentralization. When I say decentralization, I do not uh, necessarily mean uh, political, uh, uh, political, but I'm, uh, I mean decentralization in the economic and cultural uh, sense. But now this is very important. Uh, the, to avoid ambiguity with regards to the term native as stipulated in the federal constitution, Sabah and Sarawak must be allowed to decide on who is to be regarded as a native according to the state law. I think this is what the present uh, Sarawak government is doing, which is to uh, amend the uh, interpretation of native in the federal constitution. Second, I think the, the, the policy, uh, economic policy that we want to introduce in the future has to target the specific needs of the indigenous people. And third, finally, I think an independent council must be established to monitor the implementation of uh, implementation and disbursement of funds uh, to the indigenous, indigenous group so that it is not diverted by the local elites uh, for uh, political support. So with that uh, brief presentation, Kamal, uh, I end my, my talk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Arnold. Uh, lots of questions I would have loved to ask, but I think we'll go to Dr. Serena and then to the audience. Um, and their questions, but very interesting on decentralization. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll introduce Dr. Srina first. Dr. Srina Abdul Rahman is from ISIS Yusuf Isha Institute. Um, Dr. Srina is a visiting fellow at ISIS Yusuf Isha Institute, where she examines issues of unsustainable development, rural politics, and political ecology through the lens of environmental anthropology and ethnography. Trained as a conservation scientist, her practice is in community empowerment, citizen science, and environmental education for coastal habitat conservation. She is the co-founder of Club Alami, 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 a community organization that has worked since 2008 to enable a fishing community in Southwest Johor to participate in and benefit from unavoidable surrounding development and urbanization. Dr. Srina is also a Junt Assistant Professor at the National University of Singapore, where she teaches environmental politics under the Department of Southeast Asian Studies and is Malaysia's Ambassador for Citizen Science Asia. 
She's also the Iskandar Malaysian Social Hero Award winner for Environmental Protection in 2014 and has numerous academic institutions and other publications under her varied field of research. So Dr. Serena, uh, I, I guess, could, could you maybe comment on Prof Zawawi's paper in the context of the rural Malay, especially the fishing village where, where you live and have done it, um, immense work. <laughs> uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Dr. Serena. So maybe 10, 15 minutes like, like Dr. Arnold just now. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're muted, Dr. Serena. Yeah, sorry, still muted. Um, thank you, Kamal and Ideas for having me on this on this panel. It's an honor to be here and to be able to listen to Professor Zawi's voice, Z Zawawi's voice in person after reading his paper. I'm not sure I can apply the paper to the fishing community because I, I took my brain into rural indigenous areas as I was reading it. But yes, yeah, so maybe I can't do that, Kama. But um, I was actually so inspired after reading this paper that for the first time ever, I actually wrote notes on what I would like to say for the presentation. I usually just speak off the top of my head, but I am completely in awe of this publication. For me, um, you know, because indigenous people are not, are not actually my field of research. I study coastal communities and fishermen. Um, this is a fantastic reference on the formation of the NEP and its impact on the Indigenous people. I've always found it very sad how politics and politicking has led to the subordination and neglect of a people um, through time. Although, of course, you know, the willful ignorance and act of making certain ethnic groups invisible is not exclusive to Malaysia. To me, this paper has thoroughly outlined um, the issues facing, especially the Orang Asli and Peninsula Malaysia, I know even less of the Orang Asli in East Mal of the Orang Asal in East Malaysia. Um, so that's my view. I think that in Peninsula, the indigenous people are far more marginalized than in East Malaysia. And among these problems that I've always seen um, and that get to me the most really are Malayization, or Islamization, which is also carried out by a number of NGOs that pretend to send aid to these communities, or you know, by assistance that requires religious conversion in return for assistance. Thankfully, as Prof Zawawi pointed out, um, many of the Orang Asli have remained um, true to their original faiths. It is really a case of the powers that be dictating history or her story and societal norms and deciding who is able to enjoy basic human rights. Um, it is the off problem this is the off-face problem of who decides where history begins, how civilization is defined, what practices, faiths, and rituals are acceptable, as clearly the views of those in power at the time of the making of the NEP was that to be tribal is not to be civilized. Prof Zawawi had so Prof Zawawi has already explained how there was already the supranational concept of Malayness in existence at the time of the making of the NEP. And this was put forward through the dubious term Bumiputra. It was very fascinating to read and hear that this is not actually a constitutional phrase. Um, and I feel that this was done just to enshrine position and power above all others. Unfortunately, the condescension that came out as a result of this um, still occurs in many forms towards Orang Asli and Orang Asal today. Where indigeneity might be celebrated elsewhere, um, albeit romanticized, glossed over, and highlighted through nostalgia. In Peninsula Malaysia, indigeneity seems to be a marker of inferiority and a flag calling for people to be made inferior. And this is sad. I've always wondered why Peninsula Malaysia or Rangasli have had such a bad deal. They seem to have been effectively excluded by law as a result of the NEP, especially when the policy is taken out of context and weaponized as a tool to gather power opportunities and wealth at the expense of a people deemed irrelevant and made voiceless. At least there is a little bit of recognition um, in East Malaysia, in the NEP. Um, I have very limited knowledge, as I said, so I've always wondered, was it because of some kind of explicit agreement when the Federation of Malaya was formed or some kind of colonial protection? Arnold has mentioned that actually in the end, <laughs> the East Malaysian indigenous people also do not benefit from the NEP, but still, you know, there are some who have progressed, um, if we can call it that. Why was it so different in Peninsula? 
Was it because those who cooked up the NEP saw the opportunity to blatantly extract as much as they could from a people who are simply not recognized as rightful sons of the soil? Was it because those in power saw a golden opportunity to grab their land, resources, forests, and natural wealth with no concern to the people's lives, livelihoods, physical health, and identity? Prof Zawawi says that the intention of the NEP was not to ostracize the indigenous people, but it was the state that may I say abuse the NEP to inflict the pains that have come out of it. Why then, 50 years on, do some continue to make decisions for a people without hearing their voices or needs? How is it that those decisions can be made based on mere assumptions of what the Orang Asli truly want? Especially when many of these assumptions are made within a framework that places the Orang Asli at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Why are policies made on their behalf without including them as partners in a process that purports to help them. I know it is greed, perhaps human nature, capitalism, the benefits of power. What gives them this right, these decision makers who deem them superior? What other larger structures and systems made this possible at the time of the making of the NEP and over the last 50 years? How can we stand by and let so many tribes, ethnic groups, and communities remain victims to this. How is it that jurisdictional or legal overlaps and loopholes that effectively deny these people their right to ancestral sacred lands are allowed to continue to exist? Why do the laws enable some to lord over and abuse others? How can we continue to facilitate this obliteration of identity, his or her story, and at times entire existence of these people? The work by so many good um, indigenous groups and activists have shown that some populations are down to like five or 10 people. Um, Prof Zawawi mentioned earlier that there was dilution, intermarriage. We're losing these people. How can we allow them to be pushed beyond the periphery into invisibility? Should we really be pursuing development at the expense of a people? What kind of development is this? if it is not inclusive of the people whose land we arbitrarily help ourselves to and decimate for its physical or honestly monetary value. Already this is nowhere near sustainable in environmental terms. Authentic sustainability needs to include local communities. Why are the infinite intangible values of these lands, people and culture not taken into consideration at all? This paper has actually gone a long way in answering many of my questions as I've outlined above. And I truly enjoyed the read. Thank you, Prof, for writing this. It was really enlightening. It was, of course, far more effective to hear you tell the story in yours and the voices of the Orang Asli and the Orang Asal themselves um, from the excerpts that you shared and you wrote. However, with all due respect to ideas, I feel it would have been much more interesting um, and perhaps effective, given that we are talking about Indigenous identities or the loss of it and everything that has be been built in terms of governance systems and infrastructure to try to deny our Indigenous people their voice. I feel it would have been a lot nicer if we had an Indigenous person from Peninsula Malaysia here in our panel, perhaps instead of me, who knows very little. I would have loved to have heard their views on your paper as well, Prof. But most importantly, now that we are at the 50 year mark, how then do we repair the damage done? Can we finally make equality and inclusively inclusivity possible? Is this just a dream? Is it even possible in this political and pandemic climate to make changes to the NEP so as to ensure that Malaysia's indigenous people are able to authentically participate and benefit from the progress of the country all this time, notwithstanding COVID-19? I hope this paper, along with the suggestions by Arnold earlier, will spur some movement into these issues. And I thank you, Prof, for writing it and ideas for having this session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Serena. Yeah, you, I mean, you're right about the Indigenous voices. So if I could just mention some names who could have, who, who probably should have been here, could have been here from around. Colin, Colin's in there somewhere. I saw his name. Colin, Colin should be speaking. Uh, we've got, we've got a, a, a lecturer from Nottingham, Surya, Angit, Atamia. We've got Zanisa Asamalai from UKM. Uh, we've got Dayong, who's uh, uh, Robert, uh, Albert uh, Sabahan activist who works for the Freedom, Freedom Film Festival. Uh, lots of people. <laughs> but I hope they're all here at least listening and, and, and asking questions. So um, 
yeah, what you said, you know, really struck at my, and also struck a chord with me. It made me think perhaps the photo I should have put in my background was one of an oil palm estate, a new oil palm estate that's being opened in an Oransi land in Perak. <laughs> and and uh, Dr. Zawawi, do you want to respond to Anil and Serena or should I go to the first question from our audience? Um, okay, let's just give me two minutes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you to my friend from Sarawak, Orang Sabah, Dr. Anil. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting that you, you in a way are pursuing what I'm doing, but more on the kind of what's happening in, 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 in Sabah uh, in terms of the internal politics that's emerging. And I think this can be room for research to extend. Uh, uh, but the, the question still remains <clears throat> because I think if we, if we look at some of the writings by Dimbab, uh, Professor Dimbab, who's wrote a lot about you know, what's happening in Srawa in terms of land development. He's very much um, looking at the state itself, not, not, not the Malaysian state per se, but look at the, the indigenous leaders in the polity in terms of, 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 of what they are doing for their own people. So in a sense, not many actually indigenous scholars have raised this issue of looking at because normally they just blame federal government, they blame the politicians, UMNO, et cetera, et cetera. But what happened in this is a collusion. So what happened in Sarawak has everything to do with Malaysian state as well as those who control Sarawak state and those who control Sarawak state, you know? So, so the issue at stake here for the indigenous people is not just looking at the federal state and say this is a big, bad state, but they also equally have to look at their own indigenous leaders in the beds and to see what, what they, what their own elites are doing in terms of development. Because they have a lot of power as well there, uh, which sometimes land exclusively very much in their hands. You know, it's not in the federal government, punya, you know, uh, prerogative. It, it's very much controlled by, by the state government. And there's so many things that they are, what they do with land that do not benefit the indigenous communities. Um, so much as you like to pursue this politic, internal politic, I think you have also to relate it to who gets what and why, you know, uh, in terms of the context of how wealth is distributed, distributed and accumulated in the context of uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, Dr. Serena, thank you very much for your compassion because I am actually, I must tell you that when I first wrote this paper, because of my personal involvement and subjectivity, it was almost about 50,000 words. <laughs> 50,000 words. I incorporate almost everything that I read. Uh, then idea told me, cut it down to 18,000. I said, I cannot do it. So I gave to my friend, Gareth Richard, who always edited my book. I said, please Gareth, do this job for me. Um, and he, he did it. He brought it down 17,000. I couldn't, because there's so much to say, you know, in terms of very, the many examples by Pauline, by all other anthropologists working in the area, especially in terms of how the indigenous communities are reworking their own identity from within, you know, how they, they, they rework, uh, you know, but it's a very fluid situation with them, how they adjust, how they, you know, switch from one to another. Um, um, so if you look at the Bidayo, or even, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, even in, 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 in among the Kadazan Zuson, there's a lot of writing in terms of how through the media, how basically the Kadazan Zuson reacts to the national media. Very inter interesting work, which I incorporated, but I, I had to take it out because it's too much, <laughs> too much in it, you know? Um, yeah, uh, I am very much into voices because most of my work have been to record voices. I had, I put out a book uh, which I brought out the, the voices of the Penan. I call it Narrative uh, Jatadiri uh, Penan. Um, 
as published in Bahasa, uh, and I was very much dependent on my Penan student, who was the first uh, Penan university student in in uh, in Sarawak. Yeah, um, so so I incorporate in them not just writings by students themselves, but also writing by 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 by, by, by young Penan who can write. Uh, you know, they write, basically, I gave them a book, a blank book, and he, he wrote, you know, so that's his story. And others I listened to and record. Um, and there was a, a particular interesting uh, Pengulu, Pengulu Jame, uh, which I found very, very valuable in terms of his storytelling as a testimony uh, to explain why Penan, who were nomadic, should be given the right of being stewards to the land, even though they don't own land, because like unlike the cultivating tribes, the Penan do not cut trees, they do not make tamuda. Uh, tamuda is, you know, when you cultivate a piece of land and you leave it to fellow, you go to another land. Uh, and they don't have tamudas, you know. So the way that the the Afanida Pungulu Jem explain is very interesting. And how this becomes a kind of testimony to the government that they should be given rights to, to be steward on the land as well. Because his explanation is very simple. He said, even if we go to Brunei to hunt uh, the, the rhinoceros, we come back to a similar territory. Even though we move around, we have a sense of territory. And on this territory, he said, you can find the graveyard of our ancestors the graves of our ancestors. So he mentioned so many different names of his ancestors who died and be buried in the area. So this is the, the original territory. They have a sense of territory. So that this whole misunderstanding, you know, of, of, of basically of, of the law that was made, which says that up to 1958, if you do not have a Tamuda to show, you therefore cannot have rights to land, you know? So storytelling, I think it's very, very important. Um, so I'm very much into it. And if you have stories to tell, uh, maybe we can combine forces and, and write, uh, put a volume together, stories uh, together with Kamal and Dr. Um, Dr. Don, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Professor. I'll go to the first question from Jini Ng. Uh, I think this is to Professor Bobby. Do you think that to ensure that the indigenous communities is able to move forward, should there be a separation of their identity from the Muslim Bumiputra, which is very specific to Malays in Semenanjung, to a specific orang asal Semenanjung, Sabah, and Sarawak? This would then enable the economic development to be specific for them. Uh, your thoughts, Prof? I don't know whether a change of identity will make any difference because uh, it is not uh, part into power politics. And also I think if you are talking about change of terminology, it is up to the people themselves to decide, you know, we cannot decide for them. Most of the time, like even the term Ora Asli, you know, was decided by the government, you know? And I know many colonial powers uh, in Sabah and Sawa, they, they actually, they actually concocted those names, um, you know? Uh, so I think it's high time that we leave name calling, you know, uh, naming of, of what should be our tribe name to the, to the people themselves, you know? Um, I, I mean, that's, that's my thought about it. Um, and I don't think changing of names make, unless it's empowered uh, by, yeah, a political power, or you know, uh, if it's just name changing, it would not mean anything. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if we can get uh, Yogis to ask the question live. Uh, is that possible? Why is not? Why is Navi? Yogi. Yeah, Yogi. <laughs> if not, yeah. I'll read it. No. I know, I know him. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, okay. uh, that that won't be possible, but we can okay. read that one. Okay, I'll read because it's like a really mouthful. Okay, the federal constitution is not silent on the peninsula Malaysian orang asli. In fact, it expressly refers to the aborigines of the Malay Peninsula and accommodates the legal potential for their special treatment. 
uh, and he says refer to Article 160, Article 8 uh, in bracket 5, bracket C. These provisions have been interpreted by the Malaysian courts to mean that Orang Asli enjoy a unique legal position under the federal constitution, including in respect of their traditional areas. Uh, it is Article 153 and other special provisions relating specifically to Malays and natives of Sabah and Sarawak and their concomitant rights that are silent on the Orang Asli. So he, uh, his question to you, Prof, do you mean that the constitution is silenced in that sense? No, I should have read. For one of the first thing I did was to call upon you, Yogi, to send me all the articles he's written <laughs> because he has ex written exceptional articles in terms of the legal aspects. Uh, and of course, I, had, I admitted to him that uh, this is where, even though I'm an anthropologist, you know, my, my, my sense of uh, in terms of law uh, is quite limited. So yeah, on reading his, uh, some of his articles, I, I do realize there are constitutional, I, I can't remember what, but I think he's, he, he'll be the one who, to know. Uh, there are constitutional um, co provision within the constitution uh, on Orang Asli. I can't remember exactly, I, I did read it. Okay. Tell him that I did read it and, and, and I am, I, I take cognizance of the fact that, you know, um, yep. that there is the there are such provision okay. within the constitution. Thank, thank He's here, I think he can hear our, yeah, your reply. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, from Prof Pico, bagaimanakah sejarawan kita boleh mendefinasikan orang asli sebagai bukan bumi putra sebelum merdeka? Siapakah yang mencipta terma bumi putra? <laughs> Actually, Bhumiputra is a term that anybody can use. You know, you can call, because it, it just means the son or the princess of the soil. They don't say daughters of the soil. So it's also quite gendered. You know, uh, if I am, a, a, you know, a, a lady of the soil, a princess of the soil, you know, where do I fit in, uh, in the gender uh, categorization? Um, so in, in a way, it's when Bhim Putra is, is used as part of that, of that narrative, uh, which in a way, uh, the central Bhim Putrism has used in the context of a specific historical struggle uh, in terms of achieving independence. So it was a very specific term connoting that particular political context of, 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 of the political struggle. So when it's taken out of contact, it, it can mean anything else, you know. Um, and of course, when it's when it's when it's taken to apply to the question of Malaysia, then of course you have a very strong narrative of embedding Islam, Malayness, and Islam and Malay language, which is then which then become the the dominant discourse of 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 the Malaysian state. You know, it's as simple as that. You know, it's, it's logical. That's, that's why I mentioned that even before the formation of Malaysia and the formation of the developmental state, there was already the incipient, you know, uh, elements of an ethnicized state, which became ethnicizing when it became part of Malaysia. So it tried to then, you know, project, uh, extend its, its Bunputra tentacles Especially, you can see in the first instance in Sabah, where they created havoc in terms of the Mustafa and Haris, uh, you know, regime, you know, trying to bring central imperialism to Sabah, you know, uh, and some of them were had to be had to to become Muslim, and of course, Dr. M's uh, project, yeah, of increasing the number of Muslim by giving, you know, ICs to to migrants. That's also uh, you know, that, that's history, you know, in terms of, of that process of the state, central state extending Bhimputraism to the periphery. Yeah. Mute yourself, come on. Sorry, sorry. From Anonymous, language is part of an ethnicity identity. Can you share if there is policy or activity done to sustain 
the identity of orang asli in Peninsula Malaysia, particularly in language. I know that, um, let's say in Sabah and Sarawak, there are schools, I think uh, Dr. Anil can correct me, schools that are, that have, that bring in uh, the mother tongue language, like Iban, when there is a, 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 a large population uh, of, of that particular ethnic group. And in, 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 in Sabah, in Tunku Dazan. Um, but I also know that, say my, my, my reading or my research in, in, among the Katazan Duson, I've had uh, interview with teachers who told me that their students only want to speak Malay rather than their own mother tongue. Um, so they are losing their, their language uh, because it is not supported at home either, you know. Uh, so th there are this problem, and with Orang Asli, I'm not very sure. Maybe you can you can actually comment on this because you are familiar in terms of what's happening in terms of these schools uh, in among the Orang Asli now. Mm, yeah. Uh, uh, let me just pass to Dr. Anu first to talk yeah. about Sabah and Sarawak. While, while yeah, that's, think... that's, that's, that's correct, uh, Pro. Uh, for instance, in Samarahan, there is one school I know um, that offers uh, Bahasa Iban yeah. uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the pupils. And I, I remember there is also um, the Kadazan Tucson language is also offered in UMS. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think, I think in Sarawak, the, the, the legislation, there's still a legislation that South government has not signed, mm -hmm. uh, which gives a lot more uh, uh, fluidity for the government in terms of language, yeah. if I remember. They haven't signed even the national language, um, if I'm not mistaken, if you, if you read the technical details, I think there are still amendments yet pending which they have not signed, um, which gives you know, room for them to, yes. to play around with language, especially the English language. Yes. I think in, in Sabah, you also have the Kadazan Dusun Language Foundation that yes. promotes, right? Kadazan Dusun Language. Serena, anything to add to this on language? With... <laughs> so, Orang Asli, I think... No, the... other than... With... No, sorry, it's, it's very windy here. It's... um. As I mentioned earlier, with the numbers of, of you know original orang asli going down, you lose the language. Yes. Um, and this this is a huge concern. So a lot more needs to be done to. Well, you can't undilute a people if they intermarry, um, but if they're not going to get any benefits or recognition in the phase that they are, then they will, for political reasons, um, intermarry. Whether it's to get benefits from Malays, Chinese church, or anything else. Um, and as a result of that intermarriage, they will lose their language. Um, for many indigenous people also, they're, they're battling the, I think, the view that, you know, people make fun of how indigenous people speak. And so if they're out and about in society and they speak in their own language, they also understand that people will look down on them and laugh at them. Um, and I see this happening in this Malay fishing community that I'm in. They make fun of the indigenous people and how they speak because we have Orang Sleta coming in, right? Which is not very nice. But it, it becomes like a normal thing to do. And just this in itself, societal practices yeah. make it very difficult for them. It's a sense of othering. Yes, yeah. it is othering. Yeah. And, and I think with the, with the Orang Asli minorities who don't have the, the numbers, they are in a, in, in a worse position in terms of sustaining the language because official education will not do it. So either they do it themselves parents or NGOs uh, or Orang Asli, you know, volunteers who would come in and, 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 and do the job uh, on a voluntary basis, but you cannot depend on government because they will not do it. So, yeah. yeah, so for the bigger groups like Semai, if I'm not mistaken, the Ministry of Education has come up with uh, a Semai, um, how shall we put it, a dictionary on the Semai language. Um, but yeah, it, so it's for the larger groups. Yeah, and I, I would also wonder how much has this translated into the way they teach on the in the field. Um, but there's also civil movement like Janita has uh, started what she calls pendidikan dalam community, and she's created curriculums 
around Oran Asli culture, localizing it to, to yeah. the community. See, see, yeah. Well, I think what is important is to bring understanding of indigenous communities into the school curriculum, not not written by non, not written in this in this very condescending way. Uh, yeah. You know, their history needs to be written by their themselves, uh, yeah. by historians who are sympathetic to the yeah. cause of micro histories, not to the narrative of national history. Yeah. So there's not much of this, you know, the understanding by school children of what who are orang asli, uh, who are the penan, what do they do? You know, that's why you you have in, in outside school, you know, uh, people laughing, et cetera, et cetera, because there's this lack of understanding in school. So we should bring more of this. You know, the education ministry should be responsible for this. This is how you create, you create na national unity by creating this understanding uh, between groups, you know, but there's not enough of it. And it should come from within the groups themselves. And exactly, them exactly. People yeah. who are, yeah. yeah. But I think also there is there is severe urgency in doing this because the pandemic has shown that because of a lack of understanding, a lack of ability to communicate, um, you know, because there is this broken bridge between indigenous and, and other communities, they're not even getting the basic like pandemic information. That's why Rosalina mm -hmm. Idris had to come up with these programs to reach out to them in, in the many ways that work with them. So yep. I feel these are one of the you know, of the many consequences of the NEP that has led to these societal breakdowns, these difficulties for them to get just the basic rights, basic health information, basic access to things that, that everybody needed at a very difficult time. And while mm. we say that the NEP did not set out to do this, to ostracize these people, this is the fallout. Yeah. Um, and something needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can I just add to that? So uh, Dr. Rosa Selina's came up with with posters basically to edu to 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 disseminate information on covid and she had she worked with different communities among the orang asli to translate it into different orang asli dialects uh, languages and also regional uh, languages like pera in in uh, sema in pera sema in pahang and stuff like that and working with a wider group of Orang Asli Civil Society, they call themselves Orang Asli Lawan COVID. <laughs> they, <laughs> working with the Ministry of Health, uh, they came out with videos. So this was done by Dayong, uh, uh, Sema, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Orang Asli, who works at the Center for Orang Asli Concern, with Albert Sabahan, uh, I think Karazan, but I could be wrong, working with the Freedom Film Festival. They, they got together with Elroy, an independent uh, producer. Uh, well, he works for Rage. And they came up with, uh, every two weeks, I think they came up with a short video informing people about uh, what to do with COVID, you know. And Colin from COAC came up with a protocol for communities to actually use to, to regulate movement of people in and out. And if they had quarantine, how were they supposed to do it? So all of these were had to be done because we, there was no central, yes, there was no central okay. response. In, in a way, Poland, Poland has done a wonderful job yeah. with his club because they are now into internet. The whole thing is yeah. wired. Mm -hmm. the, whole, the, whole, the whole mountains are wired so they could have access you know, to outside formation, um, which, which is what <laughs> is advantageous when you have a situation like a pandemic, then you can keep up with, 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 with updated news about pandemic, what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess the answer to anonymous was there a policy on language, maybe not as strongly as we would like. Yeah. Not for the, for the small minority group. Yeah. Especially, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't exist. From Kok Liang Chiu, do you think the call for succession in Sabah and Sarawak an assertion of their indigenous people's identity uh, is an assertion of their indigenous people's identity from Peninsula Malaysia. Let me just. I, I, I would like to, Dr. Arnold, to maybe. Yeah. Oh, you, you were here in Sarawak for many, many years. Perhaps you may want to uh, share your <laughs> thoughts. Sarawak lah, cakap sendiri. Okay, I think. Put I, you in the spot, mate. Huh? Put you in the spot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, uh, in, in my class, if I uh, I talk about uh, federalism, when the topic of uh, secession is discussed, of course, 70 or 90 percent of my students from Sabah and Sarawak, they would say it's good for Sabah to be an independent state in Sarawak. 
uh, to secede from from the federation. But of course, when I uh, uh, share with them the, the the risk, you know, of being independent, the economic risk, the political risk, the military risk, then they will change their opinion. Uh, so I think this uh, this call for secession um, is primarily uh, coming from uh, the elite the elite groups. Uh, NGOs, um, politicians, but if you go to the ground, if you ask uh, the people, basically, when they talk about autonomy, when they talk about independence, they do not mean um, creating an independent state separate from the federation. They say, okay, we want independence, we want autonomy, but uh, we want culturally independent. Uh, we, do not, we want to retain our identity. We want to retain our, uh, our language. They do not want this uh, federal Malay-centric, uh, Muslim-centric model to be imposed on Sabah and Sarawak. That's it. But they still want to be in Malaysia. I mean, that's my general observation. Maybe I'm wrong. Decentralization. Uh, huh? Decentralization. Centralization. De 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 decentralization. Yes. That's 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 that's, yeah. that's my 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 uh, general observation of, of secession. But I don't know. Maybe the young generation when they are already they in the position of power 50 years or 100 years from now uh, when they when, when they are capable to succeed then perhaps uh, that's the way forward so is justifiable anyway uh, you, you mentioned decentralization earlier i was hoping you could elaborate on that because we are a federal a system we should already be decentralized in many ways yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look at the, the Malaysian federal system, we are very centralized. Uh, I mean, Malaysian federal system is one of the most unique federal systems in the world because uh, I mean, federal system is supposed to be devolving powers to the uh, state unit, uh, to the provinces and things like that, but not in the case of Malaysia. So we are very centralized, but that is why I think uh, it is uh, time for for, for Malaysia to decentralize power to the, to the state, especially to Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, but of because, course, um, when what, you look at the specifically, would you, would you talk about decentralizing education, for example? Um, yeah, why not education? Even though that is uh, very debatable, uh, for, the, for the federal government, they want Sabah and Sarawak to be integrated into the federation. And education is a uh, use for that purpose. Um, and but what what has been uh, basically? Uh, I mean, a lot of the political leaders in Sabah and Sarawak they want number one education, number two they want uh, health to be decentralized as well, and uh, as well as uh, financial decentralization. So these are the key areas which Sabah and Sarawak we just want uh, the federal government to decentralize. But, but for issues of relating to land for mm. the for the indigenous, that's very much a state thing. Yes. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with federal government. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So that is where, in a sense, you know, some of what's happening in terms of the indigenous people's feeling of insecurity, displacement, all that relates very much to their own system of power politics. Mm. Yeah. So that that needs to be looked at. In a more critical way, yeah. and it cannot be resolved by just simply, you know, becoming uh, well, being independent from from Malaysia. Yeah. You know. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Some issues lie with federation. Some issues lie with with state power itself, at the state level. I guess I'm going to ask uh, Serena now because uh, so Prost paper talks about NEP and the 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 how shall we say the assumption of the of the indigenous identity by Malay Islam, but in many ways that may not have translated also on the ground to benefit Malay Muslim communities. So Serena, coming from a rural fishing community, what are the challenges there today to their livelihood, way of life? How has NEP benefited them? It's always a it's always a useful political tool to get people in the rural communities to vote for. A Malay political party to say, you know, if you vote for other parties, they will try to remove NEP, you will lose all your Malay rights and you will lose your reverence for the king. Um, they will remove Islam as the priority in the country. And this is always um, 
the propaganda that is used in these communities. But at the end of the day, it is these communities that suffer themselves. If you are not connected to the political hierarchy, if you don't have some kind of cable, if you're not in somebody's family, they do not get any benefits, any assistance that this NEP promises. So from what I've seen out in the boondocks is that the NEP only enriches their kind. That layer of elites that Peninsula also has, not just Sabah and Sarawak, who have benefited hugely from NEP at the expense of not just other ethnicities or indigenous people, but also the Malays of their own kind. So, you know, increasingly we are hearing in the community um, when they have debates over politics or, or policies, and the, the comment is that, you know, if we if we turn over Malaysia to non-Malays, we will be destroyed. You will have now one or two voices that say, look, everybody on top is Malay, but we're still being destroyed. We still don't get aid. You know, they're all Muslim, but they only help themselves. And I think COVID really brought this out very sharply because rural communities saw how VIPs could get away with anything. And they were restricted from moving 10 kilometers. You know, they couldn't see their families and things like that. And that really hit. Um, so the NEP has not necessarily benefited the average person on the ground. The average rural fisherman or farmer without a connection, without access, without knowing how to access any of the benefits they promised to Bumiputra, it has not helped them. Um, but it has helped to make them less knowledgeable, less uh, more reliant on the hierarchy, more submissive, uh, subservient in many ways. So actually rural Malay communities are suffering nowhere near as the indigenous people have. But, you know, I think poverty crosses um, ethnic lines and those who benefit from the NEP really are those who are really seriously wealthy. Can I say something? Yeah. Yeah, coming back to what Dr. Serena has been telling us, the, the poverty among the Malays, yeah? Um, that's interesting because one of the outcome from this NEP we see is the the thinking in zero term, in zero zero term, uh, in terms of ethnic line, you know, there's a lot of against the ethnicizing state, a Malay, a pro Malay kind of state. Uh, but at the same time, when we look on the ground, among the Malays, there is this this gap, this class gap. Of course, there are middle class Malays from education that have come out. That's one of the success stories of the NAP. It has, it has middle class, yeah, the, the, the Malays and some of the indigenous communities. But apart from that, there is this gap of poverty groups within the Malay community that are at par. Maybe the indigenous community are, are worse off, but there is a sense of similarity in terms of the objective economic condition between those of lower class Malays who do not who basically you know, do, not, do not gain much from the NEP and those of the indigenous communities who are non-Muslim. So by right, there should be this consciousness, a sense of consciousness across the ethnic divide, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that could propel a kind of movement of, a, of indigenous communities movement as you get in Indonesia, for instance, the alliance of masyarakat adat, you know, in a big way, you know, they could, they could actually, you know, shape, force a challenge against the state as what happened in Indonesia. But, but it's also, yeah, it's exactly as Prof mentioned that in East Malaysia, the indigenous people have elites and they have enriched themselves as well. It's the same yeah. as Malay communities. We yeah. have elites, we have the Ketua Kampung no. who clearly is just enriching himself and not helping the community. We have Pasatuan Nalayan, which is supposed yeah. to be helping fishermen, but fishermen yeah. don't get aid. Yeah. Yeah. And they have all kinds of excuses and they just keep the benefits for themselves. So I think the problem is not really, it is not on ethnic grounds. It is just political, it is class, and it is yeah. the wealthy trying yeah. to keep yeah. the wealth for themselves. And the sad thing is when you talk about all of these poorer people coming together to, to do something is that poor Malays cannot understand that there are also poor Chinese and Indians. You know that, or honestly, they understand that. But yeah. the assumption that the belief yes, yes, which has yes. been rammed down their throats yes, for sixty-one yes, yes, years yes. is that yeah. all Indians and Chinese are rich. Yeah, but no, yeah. there are that's, so many yeah. poor of all races. Yeah, that's um, why. 
So, so when we talk about accountability here in Sabah, uh, sorry, uh, autonomy, it is not just autonomy. It is about autonomy with uh, accountability and responsibility. Yeah, otherwise, uh, autonomy will uh, empower the local elites. And they yeah. can do whatever they want with that autonomy. Yeah. So, so essentially, we're back to a, a system which is in which class is the main basis of of uh, of um, difference. Yeah, of creating difference, um, not not race. You know, no. but it's guys. The Bumputerism NAP in a sense is a disguise. Is a way of disguising this class basis of of difference, of differentiation, you know, and, and put it in terms of ethnic kind of differentiation, you know. Um, so that's an interesting take. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, maybe we can explore that a little bit. But I've got one question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Awang, Dato, yeah, yeah, the former DG of Jakwa, but he's not posted a question. And unfortunately, uh, Dato, you, we can't have you ask a question on air. But maybe you can type out your question. Uh, from a student from UKM, Nazir Shah Muhammad, kenapa pembahagian kelompok etnik dan ras dalam sistem bancian penduduk masih dikekalkan malah seperti masih dianggap perlu terutamanya semasa mengisi borang berkaitan maklumat peribadi misalnya penggunaan istilah lain-lain bagi merujuk kelompok minoriti seperti Iban, Kadazan Dusun, Orang Asli dan sebagainya sedangkan ini bagai meminggirkan kewujudan identiti mereka di Malaysia. Sekiranya nanti jumlah orang Iban dan Kadazan Dusun semakin bertambah dan melebihi orang India adakah ia bakal mewujud konsep lima kaum terbesar pula? Sebagaimana sering kali hanya tiga suku kaum sahaja diketengahkan, iaitu Melayu, Cina dan India. Not sure. <laughs> this is called this is called ethnic mapping, uh, uh. very much a colonial product of of you know. And uh, if if you look at the statistics, for instance, in terms of orang asli, it comes under Malay. There's no specific. Uh, it's so uh, you know so. So you have this, this problem of, of data manipulation uh, in terms of categories that are available. Um, if, you, if you want to find data on Bumi Putra um, poverty, uh, it's also very difficult uh, in terms of East and West Malaysia because it is, it is, it is collapsed. It, is, it comes uh, under a, 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 big, a bigger category of sort. Um, I think we, we do have problem with that. Um, Should we do away with it? <laughs> I say we do away with identity card. We say, what is your religion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. That's the first way of, of, of not thinking in ethnic or religious terms. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned intra-ethnic contestation, Dr. Anil, uh, but you were talking in terms of political representation. What, what about class within... Sabah and Sarawak, how are they represented? Um, yeah, the, the class is there as well. But then when I, uh, when I mentioned about uh, intra-ethnic, uh, I did not, because when you look at the uh, ethnic politics in Peninsula Malaysia, uh, scholars always look at it in terms of the inter, uh, in the, in the, the, the conflict between the Malay, the Chinese, the Indians, it's always between one big, particular ethnic group with the rest. But in Sabah, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, the conflict can also happen within that particular ethnic group. Mm -hmm. So I talk about the Kadazan, yep. within the Kadazan and the Dusun, you know, the Dusun and uh, within the subgroups within the Dusun uh, community. Uh, so this is what I, 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 I meant by intra-ethnic yep. intra rivalry. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we've got 10 more minutes. Uh, not really a lot of questions coming in. Um, there is a comment from Chai Yi Ho. Thank you, Dr. Srina, for voicing your comprehensive views on how the indigenous people have been marginalized and left out of the NEP. Their rights needs to be addressed going forward. And I think, I think we can disagree with that. Um, is there anything else we might want to add before I pass us over to Vaisnavi? Well, I can just say thank you guys for coming on board. 
Amal, Dr. Sujana, and Dr. Arno. Thank you. We well, hope to meet you. up with you. I'm honored, Prof. Amazing. And, Thank well, you. And I, I, would like to, I wish I, I could read like... the original long manuscript. <laughs> yeah, right send, send me your email. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you, to you. And I would <laughs> like to, to share some of your, your writing. Dr. Arno as well, your federal... Yeah. Uh, papers, I yeah, mean, I mean. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. such an honor. Yeah. Thank Good you, to see you guys. I, Anna yeah, and Kamal. Can, yeah, can I just ask for a closing remark? Sorry, my bad. <laughs> oh, closing remark. Ask for a closing remark from each of you to the paper. <laughs> Maybe we start with Dr. Srina first, and then Anil, and finally Dr. Prof. Zawawi. Um, closing remarks. The paper was amazing. I think everybody should read it. I want to read the original long form. Uh, but I think we need to do more than just write. I think yeah. we need to put this into action and make change. Um, and it needs to start now, now. Actually, it needed to start like 45 years ago. But <laughs> we can start now. You were it's, not born yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Dr. Anu? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thank you, Prof. Uh, because I think when I read your paper, I learned quite a lot as well because it's very rich with empirical data. Uh, and the way you conceptualize the issue of identity, ethnicity is, is for me, is, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, and it's just that I hope in, uh, in your next writing, probably you can uh, uh, look at the uh, intricacy, uh, the, the conflict between the different uh, groups uh, in, in Sabah, between the Tagazan and the Bison, and how that resulted in the construction of uh, a different ethnic uh, identities for them. Uh, and and I, I also thank you for uh, uh, telling me that basically for us in Sabah and Sarawak for, 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 for long, we've been looking at the Malaya as some sort of a villain, you know, uh, and we always talk about anti-Malaya and uh, anti-Malaya sentiment is quite still quite strong in Sabah and Sarawak. But I think it is time for us also to look at it uh, uh, internally, uh, look at what's happening within our political elites and study, uh, as you say, uh, what's their motivation and what's their agenda, rather than just focusing on uh, the uh, what's happening in Peninsular Malaysia. So thank you for that, Prof. My turn? Prof. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I just want to thank uh, two panelists for joining in. And um, um, it, I just hope that maybe future research can can get into the the dynamics of internal state politics in terms of development. Um, you know, I think I think that if we talk about Malaysia, we're talking about two state system. One, the federal, which is a state with its sense of power, everything, and then you have the state at the level of the state level. It's also a state. Don't, don't, don't forget, don't say that it's not a state. Of course, there are some powers that are vested in federal government, but that particular state is also vested with a lot of power. And how power is being used in terms of indigenous people's development is also very important, how that relates to politics. You know? um, so again, thank you uh, for coming on board and thank you, uh, Dr. Kamal, for being the moderator. We must have Teta Ray. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will have another one. And, and just to spend yes. time unpacking everything that you wrote. So if I can just <laughs> have my say on the paper, it was, it was refreshing find, reading it after a long, after you know, getting engaged theoretically uh, with a very intelligent piece of paper, with a very, very intelligent and critical piece of work. Um, I work with communities now that are contesting this discourse, as you put it, Dr. Prof. Zawawi, storytelling, and, and just speaking with speaking by moving. And so these are things that COEC and some of the affiliates to COEC are, uh, are looking at, you know, going people moving out of the RPS, the resettlements, and moving back mm. to their customary land. And also I've been doing a little bit of mapping on customary land with the Jahai who are semi-nomadic. And what you say totally ring true, you know, there is a boundary, there, there is a sense of boundary. But it's not uncommon to hear civil servants continue to say that Torasi land is as far as the squirrel can run, you know, or as yeah. far as I can see, uh, very patronizing, um, you know, and I, think I, and I think this work is important. Thank you for highlighting that. I think storytelling is important. It's a way to, it's a counter narrative, a way to under, undermine the discourse in, in many ways, but we need to write about it. 
and also to, to get platforms where people can speak about it themselves. So thanks again, Prof. Thanks, uh, Dr. Anil. Dr. Thank Sina. you. And um, I'm just going to pass over to Vaishnavi from Ideas. Thanks, Ideas, for this platform. Fantastic. Thank you. thank you so much, Dr. Kamal, for uh, facilitating today's discussion. Um, and thank you to Prof. Zawawi for that excellent presentation. Thank you to the panelists uh, for such a rich discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and to Dr. Srinath, thank you so much for highlighting uh, the importance of Orang Asli representation on our panel. We would very much like to have uh, OA voices represented, and we did extend our invitation to Dr. Ram. Unfortunately, she could not join us today. Uh, we will make sure to uh, work harder to ensure right representation is included uh, in our future panels. Um, to everyone who has joined us today, thank you so much. Uh, this is comes to this brings an end to our NEP webinar series. Uh, we will be uh, uh, releasing some infographics on all three papers uh, next week, and all three authors have also written uh, opinion articles that will be published sometime next week. Uh, if you would like to download the full version of all three papers, please do visit our website at ideas.org.my. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for your questions um, and have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. I think